Vicki, so good to be on with you again. I'm so happy to see you, Ed. You are always such a joy. You are too, my dear. You know, Ed, I have so loved, you know, I, I was showing you before we went live what I have done. Well, okay, so this was a galley. That's why it's got the spiral. Thank you for doing that. But I have, I, I have... I have drank many cups of coffee while I've read your book and destroyed it, but loved every single word. And well, that's like it. Exhibit A that you actually read it, the look <laughs> of that book. I've never been more proud of anybody who's read it. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. I want to jump right in, Ed, because I, I have a lot of curiosity, but there's one thing that really struck me above everything else, and I kept waiting for you to address it in the book. And if you did, I missed it. But at one point in the book, you said that getting sober did not stop, did not change your behavior. It wasn't, it took you a little more time. First of all, you're a blonde haired, blue eyed, who would believe liar, cheater, crazy. Well, I don't know if you were a cheater, but you're a big liar. I you, big you big were, liar, big cheater. Yeah. Great, you were yeah, and cheater and 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 just a wild man who would expect, but you said that you didn't that the lying part anyway didn't change right away when you got sober. Just that I was allowed to lie somehow in my mind to one small demographic, just about half the people on the planet known as women. women. It was okay Only to lie women. to them about yeah. <laughs> okay, always be faithful to your guys. Yeah, tell them the truth, but. <laughs> You know, make up a story. Why is your hair wet when you come home? I stopped at Harry Dean's. We went for a swim. <laughs> no, it's it's wet because I was in the shower with somebody. That's why my hair is wet. And I just, it, I mean, it's fine if you want to have more than one partner. That's I'm not a Puritan. Go right ahead, but make sure that your partner or wife knows that. You know. So what made you? At what point did that change for you, and why? That's what I really wanted to know. It's a, it's a, being sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, different things. That we try we try drugs drugs we try alcohol we try gambling we try cheating and all of those things did not work for me in the long run or even in the short run so i finally gave up uh philandering in 1997 i've been completely committed in a wonderful relationship for years starting in 93 but it was 97 when i finally gave up on all that nonsense and it's much much better i can tell you it's much better you figured it out to be with one person than a number of people. What was there something that made that decision helped you make that decision? My dad was married to a wonderful woman named Amanda Begley. My mother, Amanda, was a wonderful baby, had three kids with them, Tom, my sister Aileen, and me. Only uh none of those. Only were Tom her kids. wasn't really her yeah, that's exactly why. Tom was actually my aunt's son, my cousin. Tom was my cousin, as it turns out. And Amanda wasn't a mother to any of us. Uh she the, you know, she was my stepmother, as it turned out, she died when I was seven. And then I later learned, you know, when I get my driver's license, who my real mother is, there was this woman I was crazy about called Sandy. And we'd see her once a year at Grand Central Station. And that turned out to be my mother. And so uh, this is so Chinatown, this story. I know. <laughs> sister, mother, sister, mother. So. OK, so your father was that way so was it in your genes is that what you're saying that's the excuse that's the excuse either in the genes or whatever it is uh, learning by experience from your somebody who's supposed to be emulating good qualities you know getting the traits from your father learned you know behaviors and traits i thought it was okay to do that to have multiple partners or girlfriends and just tell them what you need to tell them to get through the day or the week or the year and uh it's okay to to be fictitious about those sorts of things. When of course it's not, it doesn't help anybody. So, but was there, be, <clears throat> did you have an emotional bottom? What Was there a defining incident that got, because what makes somebody after you, you get sober, you start working a program of recovery, you, you start getting real, you work this stuff, you do this stuff. What makes you five years later or however many years it was, change that behavior i'm just really curious about this oh no, it's a good question because stuff there's there's addictive behaviors that are more obvious when i first had the dts i knew something was wrong and i needed to you know get to a recovery program and i did 
Right. But then the denial is so great. At that point, when I first went to meetings, it was in 1976. And I was, you know, 27 years old. So 21 days, never even 30 days, you know, I'd start to feel better again. I felt better after three days. And I went after 21 days, I go, oh, you know what? I don't think I had the DTs. I had food poisoning. That's what happened. <laughs> You know, I would have all these excuses by what ha for what happened each time. I was allergic to the whatever, you know, and so I did that for a while to find it was obvious. It was none of those things I theorized it was. It was alcoholism. It was drug addiction. Then I went through those same processes with gambling and with uh, philandering. And, and finally so got well. Different uh, things took different amounts of time. Yeah. And it's the bottom is more clear with drinking when you're, you know, getting arrested and thrown in county jail. And all these other things are happening, <laughs> running into cars on Sunset Boulevard, knocking the mirrors off cars, accidentally parked on Sunset. All that You were stuff doing more... some crazy ass shit. You were crazy ass shit is the only way to describe it. So that's obvious, you know, get to meeting, do something. But the other stuff, well, it's OK. Are you, are you in a new relationship now? Are you going to try better this time, buddy? Are you going to, you know, I gambled as recently as I think a couple of years ago. I'd been uh, I hadn't placed a bet in like 20 years, and I decided to be okay to try that again. My bottom was very, it was a high bottom at that point. I lost maybe five or 10 grand. I don't even think that much. And I went, I, this is not fun. Why am I doing this again? But I went 20 years without placing a bet and gambled for a, a few weeks back in 19, uh, no, not 19, anything, 2000. 18, I think, or something so like that. So in other words, when you started to gamble again in 2019 or whatever, it, you felt the addictive compulsion to do it? I felt a rush and it was great because I was winning at first, as you sometimes do. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's really the worst thing that could happen because those, if you win right away, you know, you go, well, I finally got this cracked. Even, you know, no matter what's going on, I'm not going to win by going to the City of Commerce and playing with those people there. They're highly, highly skilled mathematicians that go and play in the city of commerce most of them are the rest are people like me you know when you don't know who the the mark is in the card game it's right. probably you and so <laughs> you know they have dealers there there's sanctioned dealers that work for the club and not you don't get to touch the deck yourself but still there's all kinds of behavior that can kind of skew things in their favor you know it's not a winning comedy but even if it's a it's a totally honest poker game with your friends a guy like me is gonna win at a game like that then i'll go to vegas and lose it all and then some so i just don't gamble anymore okay so this is basis. interesting because i know that you're a gamer i know you like to play games right the games are fine games of monopoly are fine or you know some people can't even play that that's not a trigger for me to play monopoly or to play do the jumble or do the crossword or do wordle or you know, all those wonderful fun games to play a game called Celebrity. We play with groups of friends. Mm -hmm. There's no money that exchanges hands, but I really can't play an even like a church bingo game. I can't because that's a trigger. The way I started gambling again, I'll tell you, is exactly just what I'm talking about. My dear friend, Ed Asner, now deceased, but a wonderful guy, a dear friend. He had his, for his wonderful you. Ed Asner Foundation, poker he had this right? poker tournament and I did it more than once. I said, Rochelle, this is, it's not for money. I'm just doing it to help the charity. It's not a trigger. You think it's a trigger. It's not. I was lying for the first day. I got a rush off it. I went gambled right away within a few weeks of going to that first tournament. Didn't tell her about it. So I'm lying to my wife again. I'm losing money. You know, disaster. Okay, so that, that's way. my follow-up question to this. So I know a lot of people in recovery who claim, oh, you know, once I got sober, I stopped lying. I stopped cheating. I stopped philander i stopped all this behavior i stopped gambling but you know then i hear some people years later say oh you know i was 40 years sober and i realized i was still lying every day i was still a bullshitter and i caught myself you know and it's not that easy to change these behaviors you know it's it as you said with a substance we know we're ingesting or we're not ingesting with behaviors right. it's so much harder to behave to it is but I went right back to a GA meeting and started to practice their principles again. And it, it works very well. You know, I just don't place a bet one day at a time. And so now it's been a couple of years again that I'm uh, not placing a bet. And I can't imagine I'd go back and do it again. Anything's possible, but it's a daily thing. I don't have to plan for 2025. I just have to get through today and not go to the city of commerce or Vegas or anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> or bet on the scratcher. But I, I never played scratchers or anything like that. Those are terrible odds. So I one th another thing that, well, many things in, in your book, to the temple of tranquility and step on it, that's going to be backwards and all messy. But look at Ed's version. Look at Ed's cover behind him because it's beautiful and not messed up like mine. Um, you, you tell a story about being sober for a while, or, or I think it was when you very first got sober in, in your first year, a few months, and you decide it would be okay to have a little wine. You try wine, right? And then you try a little beer. None of it tastes good. But your wife at the time busts you. And she said, because look at your face. And I'm trying to remember what she says your face looked like. Um, what does she say your face looked like? She said to me, she said, you're different. I knew you were drinking when you walked in the front door. You're 25 feet away, but I knew you were drinking because of you look different. I said, what do you mean different? She said, you look like that guy that's trying to get the keys from the dog. I said, what are you talking about? The guy that's trying to, in the burning jail cell. Oh, you're talking about Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah, the guy that's chasing around the circle for the wench. You look like that. I looked in the mirror in the dining room. Sure enough, there was Roy Disney standing across from me, you know. I look like one of the people that they, you know, they modeled different characters in the Pirates of the Caribbean on Roy Disney and other people who worked in, uh, you know, the audio animatronics. And, and I look like a 50 year old guy here. I was 30 years old. I literally looked, to be quite fair, about 45 or, you know, nearly 50. Just from drinking a few beers one night, a bottle of wine the night before that. It was amazing how it was doing its subtle work on me and quickly. So, Ed, what what motivated you to write this book? What 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 was it? I mean, you have an incredible story. You know everybody. I'm going to cough, so I'm going to mute. Excuse me. You're you still know, muted. I'm sorry. You're back. You know, You're you back. know everybody. I mean, literally everybody. The list is incredible, from Nicholson to Meryl Streep to Marlon Brando. And first of all, all the girls you've loved. Oh my God, we have to talk about some of the women you've loved. But was the motive? I know the motivation wasn't to name drop. That was certainly not the reason you wrote this book. You have no, a story I, to tell. What? Tell me. Tell us why. It began innocently enough. It was Hayden, really, that was the catalyst for it. She wanted to record on her smartphone some stories about my grandparents coming over in a boat from Ireland, my father's life in the radio and the theater, my career. She wanted to get as much of that as she could or at least as much as her data plan and battery capacity would allow. So she started doing that, but she can't do it every minute of every day. So I was so hungry to write more stuff down. I thought also maybe I can muscle her out of any uh, rights to the royalties if I started doing it myself. So I, I didn't <laughs> want to pay a ghostwriter, even my own daughter. I'm a cheapskate. So I started to write some stuff down. I'm kidding, of course, but notes <laughs> for my daughter, notes for a potential ghostwriter, because I was very open to it at that point. That maybe this will, a ghostwriter will help me. And a, a literary agent, a wonderful one, David Vigliano, had suggested it. So I started to take some notes, and that's when it finally happened. The keyboard became like a Ouija board that actually worked. You know, it started to take me this place and that. I wanted to go over here. It took me up to the base, you know, down to the basement or up in the attic of my mind. Different things, opening boxes you hadn't opened, boxes of memories for decades and decades. And it was a wonderful, cathartic process. I just wrote it down as notes at first, and pretty soon I had 45 pages that were not at all notes. They were clearly chapters to a book. And then I pressed on, and pretty soon it took me three months to do about 80% of it, then another two or three months to do the remaining 20. Well, that's, by my estimation, very speedy. I don't want to tell you yeah. how many years it took me. It seemed quick to me, too. It looked, it seemed quick. And did you do this during the pandemic? Is that Did you use the pandemic to get this done? I did. I started during that very period of time. I had plenty of time on my hands. We weren't really back to shooting much. Although you I, worked quite a bit through the pandemic, didn't you? I did. I started to work in August of uh, 2020. There was a thing up in Reno. We couldn't shoot in California for good reason. I understood and supported all that. But in Reno, you could shoot. In Nevada, you could shoot. Mm. They didn't shoot a lot of things, but they shot this Christmas movie. And the rule was, they had a big table out front. This was all new to us back then. And it, you had to get tested before you go into the location with the windows open all the time at this house we shot at with hand sanitizer and masks on everybody. But everybody that got tested, two people tested positive. They told them to turn on their heels, go back to the hotel and wait further instructions. 
and nobody on that that whole show got sick. So I went, well, that's kind of promising. This could work. And then more people started to work. Young Sheldon started to work and other shows started to work. And pretty soon a lot of shows were back with a very expensive, you know, addendum to the budget that now you have to pay. It was like another 25 percent in any TV show or movie budget to do the COVID testing. It was a lot of money. Right. And so now your timing's really good, Ed, because now not only did you get to write during the pandemic, but now you're on book tour during the strike. So you're, I know. you're still you're still in motion. You're not. Well, that's getting... the story of my life. You read the book. I literally like Forrest Gump or, you know, Chauncey Gardner or Zelig. I wind up in these. I'm suddenly I'm there in Yalta. I'm in Yalta and the background is assigning the peace treaty, you know. Figuring out you how to have up been and... everywhere with everybody. I mean, from smoking a joint with Charles Manson, which is in the book, which is crazy, to crazy t- talking crazy stuff with Marlon Brando. That I, I, I don't, I didn't even understand that chapter to tell you the truth. I, I don't know what you were talking about with Marlon Brando. I was trying to get a handle on that. No, there's know. no understanding it. It was, I, I was baffling to me blonde, too. I was having a very blonde moment during during those chapters. During he those he parts. proposed to get electricity from electric eels and. That's not really a viable way to get electricity. So it seemed uh, very. You're odd. not understanding. It puts you on the right side of things. <laughs> and but okay, so there have been all these incredible women that you have, uh, and Rochelle being the most amazing of all of them. If I'm, you know, if I'm biased, but she is. But starting with, I think the first one that I noted was Cindy Williams, and I had no idea. I I knew never something. romantic though. We were just friends. We were. But you didn't. But like, you wanted it to be. Oh, you very big... much so. I wanted to marry Cindy. I wanted to date her. I wanted all. You know that didn't stop me from, uh, you know, pursuing her. But she had a wonderful boyfriend, as it turned out. And then I became great friends with him. His name was Harry Giddis, a great producer. Produced uh, Going South that I did with Jack and, and Harold Schneider South. produced that with him. Harold Schneider and Harry Giddis were two dear friends of mine. Uh, Harry Giddis also produced About Schmidt. Harry and Walter go to New York, did a bunch of movies. A great guy. He came out of Madison Avenue in New York, came to L.A. and kind of took L.A. by, strong, by storm and knew all these wonderful people like Jack Nicholson, and Helena Calinotes and Buck Henry and just wonderful people. And I got to meet them all through Cindy and Harry. They were my entree from Van Nuys to the Valley, uh, from the Valley to Beverly Hills and all that came with it. Yes, you certainly moved in extraordinary circles. And and did you, did it, well, well you were a fan, but I was going to say, did it seem natural to you? But you, but you were in awe of these experiences that you were having at the time you were having them, weren't you? Very much so. I was very much, a, you know, I had a foot in both worlds. I was a fanboy, certainly, of all these people, but I knew how to comport myself and act like I, you know, was so somewhat blasé about it, certainly calm about it. Because from the youngest age before all this happened with Cindy and, you know, and Harry and all of that and Jack Nicholson, these all the all these superstars, I got to meet uh, all these people with my dad in radio and in uh, TV, early TV. I got to meet Steve Allen, who was a big deal when I was growing up. Steve Allen was Absolutely. a huge star. And people like that, Bill Nye, not Bill Nye. Um, uh, oh God, I'll think of his name. Louis Nye, Louis Nye. Sure. Sorry, Louis Nye and Tom Poston. These guys, these were incredible stars in in television and in movies. So I got to meet these people, and I knew how how to behave for my dad. Don't do that. Don't ask him for an autograph, please. They're they're working. And so when I happened upon this other crowd of people in Los Angeles, I knew not to to blow it with some fanboy behavior and I kept getting invited back somehow you know well you were also um with many of them early in your days good time party boy you and Harry D Stanton certainly had your and Harry Nilsson oh my god did you guys have some crazy times I mean crazy there times some, there are some, I, it, it's hard to believe some of the things you did actually and it's um, hard for me to believe but uh we did them just the same. I made the mistake once of trying to outdrink Harry <laughs> Nelson. I would not recommend that. Where he's still around, it was he was a champion of sorts in uh, vodka consumption. So I didn't make that mistake again. Did did things change when you got sober so young? Um, you've been sober forty four years. I want to say I got sober in nineteen seventy nine. So yeah, forty uh, forty. 
let's see, 79. My math is suddenly bad. It's almost 44 years. Yeah. 40, so did did that crowd of people that you were drinking with, hard drinking with, did it change? Did your relationships with them change? Yeah, I had to avoid certain people for a while. The people, you know, with whom I had a relationship based on drug and alcohol consumption. I had to cool it for a while, but then I got strong enough and set enough in my program where I could spend time with them again, not be at great risk. But keep in mind, I went out again after a year and a half. So I obviously wasn't doing everything perfectly yet. And wh why was that? What what happened that, that caused you to go out again? I know exactly what happened. Uh, I was uh, different. I was busy. I was whatever you want to call it. I was going to do it. I was going to do the steps to get a sponsor, but I was just too busy. You don't understand. My schedule is difficult. I got to go down to Cuernavaca and do this <laughs> movie with Peter Falk and Alan Arkin, the in-laws. You don't have a schedule like mine. I can't get a sponsor right now. I can't do the steps. And that's all bullshit. You know, you have to do that if you want to live long enough to go show up at a movie in Cuernavaca and get it finished. You have to do the steps properly. And I didn't do that because I thought I was different and special. When I finally got a sponsor and worked the steps, listen to guys like Billy Boyle. Then I, I, I thought so that was the trip that you didn't drink. I thought I did not drink on that trip, trip but then I drank. Uh, Later, that was 78, when I almost died, had the DTs and went to Cedar sinai They pulled me through. That was 98, uh, 78, sorry. And after that, I did uh, I did the movie The In-Laws, but then I drank again in December of 79 because I was just, it was too much pressure and I was going to do, um, uh, what, what, no, something, oh, we had bought a house. We had bought a house in 79 and the pressure from the house payments and everything, I went, I can't take it. I got to drink just to study my nerves so I can get a get a job here, which is just what they want. If, you know, an alcoholic who's drinking again, that's going to really guarantee me a job, isn't it? And I literally thought somebody was trying to poison me. I was looking at the wine bottle to see if there was a mark from a hypodermic needle that someone had poisoned the wine bottle. That was the only explanation for the way I felt after drinking just a few glasses of wine. I felt totally toxic. Not the next morning, not a hangover. That night, I felt... Terrible and the same thing the happened when you when you tried beer, right? You said, so now I'm going to drink beer because... Yeah, I thought, yeah. okay, I've heard about this. I thought I was either born with or I developed an allergy to tannins. There's something called tannins <laughs> in red wine. This was red wine. So I developed an allergy to tannins. It's amazing the way an alcoholic can rationalize things. So I went and had some beers at that Chinese, sorry, that Japanese restaurant at Gower Gulch and had my veggie sushi and what have you and my miso soup. And I had it a nice cold Kieran and drank it. It tasted fantastic, Vicky. The second one somehow was weird. Maybe they didn't refrigerate it properly. It didn't taste so good. The third one, I couldn't finish it all. It tasted rotten, like it had gone bad or what have you. So then I, I got to go home because the wife's expecting me. And I stayed too long at the restaurant. And I go home and I realized I got a shower because I could smell beer. Did I spill beer and forget about it? My skin, my pores are going like this with my face. I can smell beer coming out of my pores. And that's when I walked in the house and tried to get to the shower. Your wife, my wife, Ingrid, drops the plate of food. Go, oh, my God, you're drinking again. You're drinking again. Because she, she accurately said wow. you look like one of the characters from Pirates of the Caribbean at age 29. Wow. That's just crazy. So. Age 30, actually. I was 30 then. So you learned to be strong enough to be able to hang out with those people. Did any of those people that you that were heavy drinkers that you partied with was it a turn off to any of them that you weren't drinking did it bother anybody did anybody give you a hard time about it there was some people that it bothered or they felt threatened or felt like they lost a drinking buddy that happened a bit but mostly people also after you know i finally got sober in 79 then came the 80s and just say no and all kinds of stuff happened sadly we lost the wonderful great comedian my dear friend john belushi so a lot of people started to be concerned about this and see that it might be a problem for some of us. And uh, people started to get sober. And Carrie Fisher called me from rehab. She was a dear, dear friend of mine. I'd known her since she was a young, young girl and uh, loved her and loved her mom, Debbie. And and so uh, that was tough to lose her fairly recently. But a lot of people got sober or wanted to get sober. So I was in a position to help a lot of people having gotten sober finally finally gotten sober sobriety that sticks to this day in 1979. 
God bless you, Ed, and and thank you for trudging the road and leading the way, um, and and being such a power of example. But I seem to recall in the book too that. John and Judy Belushi were worried about you because of your level of consumption. When John Belushi is worried about you, you know you're, cons you're consuming quite a bit he of was, substance. He and Judy were definitely my salvation. They came into the lobby of the hotel there, the El Presidente Hotel in Durango, practically dragged, out, dragged me out by my collar. Come on, come on. You're not going to sit anymore. Put the drink down. Put the, put the drink down. Come on, you're going out. You're going to see some of the town. I didn't even, I didn't know what the town looked like. I hadn't seen any of it. Came right from the airport to the hotel, put my bag in the room, went right to the conversation pit there to out drink this guy called Shorty George Smith. <laughs> and so I didn't have any luck with that, like Harry Nilsson. But, uh, but I, they were my salvation. John was, a, I don't want to dwell on things that happened to John at the end, but he was a great guy. He was, he saved me on that day and many others and a great, great comedian. I just loved him as a friend and as a, comedy genius. I, I really adored the man. So let's talk about that minute because you started out in comedy and um, you had a very, um, a, a, you had an amazing part. Tell us about your, your comedy partner, which is amazing too. I went to Valley College with uh, mm -hmm. Jan Fisher and James Jeremiah, who wrote a movie called Lost Boys. <clears throat> Van, Jan is gone, but James, I saw to today and I'll see tomorrow. We've been friends since 1968, my college oh, pal. Amazing. And then Michael Richards, I also met at Valley College, and we had a comedy act, and we went to the Troubadour, and we went to the Ice House, and tried to get work in those clubs. We went to the comedy store the week that they opened. When, and uh, so what was your act like with Michael Richards? Were, <clears throat> did you guys, uh, did you have set bits? Did, were you totally on the fly? What did, what did you do? It was totally on the fly. We did improv and we thought we had invented Im improv. We had no <laughs> idea there was a Viola Spolin or a book about it or Del Close or, you know, Gary Goodrow or John Brent or any of these, Julie Payne, these great comedy geniuses. You know, we just thought we had invented it. And Avery Schreiber actually came one night to watch us Doug Weston asked him to come and watch our set and see if he thought we had potential. And Avery Schreiber had some great notes for us about improv. We paid attention to none of it. We thought, well, we don't have to play by any of those rules. But we're <laughs> special. I always thought I was very special when I was younger. Well, you are very special, but I but I yeah. understand what you're saying. But you you also have a wonderful admission in the book about about Michael and about uh, were you guys roommates at the time and you got a phone call. And... Yeah, I got a phone call from, we were roommates, and uh, I got a phone call about doing a, a voiceover cartoon or something. The, my agent, my voiceover agent said, would you give me an example of what you do? So I went, yeah, of course, I could be that guy, this kind of a nerdy guy like that. And I kind of did the voice and did the thing and um, said, okay, let me talk to them, uh, the producer, and see if they're willing to see you. As it turns out, I didn't get the part, but Michael was very upset with me. I went, what, what are you mad about? He said, you're doing my character. I said, oh, great. I see. Doing that voice. You own all high-pitched nerd voices now. Is that it? Uh, anybody does a high-pitched nerd voice? That's You own that? What are you talking about, Michael? <laughs> I wasn't at all remotely doing that. When the truth is, I absolutely was. I was absolutely imitating his character, Ernie, that he'd done around the halls of Valley College. And I just kind of, it just came to me. I didn't think, well, let me mimic Michael Richard, but I was doing it nonetheless. And so... Uh, but I that wasn't something you realized at the time. You didn't realize that till I didn't realize how jealous I was of his gift, of his ability to just do anything, to pantomime anything and to make sounds that I had not yet learned to make as a comedy performer. He could make, you know, the sound of machine gun fire, or all sorts of other things to enhance what he was doing with his uh, physical, you know, gift. He was a very talented man. That, And you saw the result of it on Fridays and then on Marblehead Manor and finally on Seinfeld, which is, you know, comedy history. So what what, what ended your, your duo relationship? <sighs> Michael went in the army and I went off and started to work on my own at a club called Tulagi in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado. I moved to Boulder, Colorado for a while. Mm -hmm. Then I did okay there and wrote some more material. And then I came back to LA for just one job but then there was another job and another job and another. And I finally got what Michael and I had wanted all along, what I wanted all along, which was a booking at a nightclub, a real nightclub, not a 
a picnic at a park in Burbank or something. Oh. What Michael and I got, we got a, I got a, Mike was in the army. I got a booking at the ice house as a comedian. And so that was just, I felt I had arrived and I, then I got a booking at the Troubadour. I was playing clubs and colleges and concerts around the country. Some point Michael came back, we gave it a try again, but I was just out. He was out of my league. I couldn't keep up with, you know, what he was able to do as a comedian. I just, how was the skills? The, how was the friendship at that point? What was totally fine. We were great friends for years, uh, you know, for many, many years. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while now, but I saw, have seen him many, many times over the years. We raised families together. That's a beautiful thing. So you straddled this world of acting because you started, as I recall, your first acting job was like on My Three Sons, which was a gazillion years ago with our friend Stanley Livingston. Um, but th so you started out as a child actor, then you moved over to comedy. So how did you get back to acting? Why did you you were you were doing stand up in huge venues opening for huge acts? Why did you come back to acting? Because that was not a successful night for starters. That night at Nassau Coliseum, I opened for John Sebastian Poco and Log in the Messina. But my punchlines, I was a prop comic. My punchlines were on these like 16 by 20 size, you know, things, things that are sometimes a hand prop. <laughs> now, the first 10 rows loved my ass. They were laughing their ass off. Row 11 out, Poco, 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 you know, started chanting for the next act. So I hadn't thought it through very well. So in the future, I had a slide projector and I had audio playback and stuff so everybody could hear and see it. My friend Tony Amatulo, that's Bruno Kirby's best friend, became my best friend too. And he came went on the road with me and we did the act together for a while. But then showbiz beckoned, you know, suddenly I was asked to be on this show and that. So I dropped the comedy stuff like a hot potato because it was just too much work. What was the thing? I mean, I, I remember you from Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, Great show what what got what was the first thing after i i know you did um my three sons when you and then you did you were on the dating game which is like bizarre it's very <laughs> bizarre i went on it i think four times at least four times because each time i went on i got paid i was an after so they had to pay me to be on it was a way to make a few bucks <laughs> the first time i got picked i think no the first time i didn't get picked the next time i did get picked went to australia that's a pretty good Wow. Date. Yeah, not bad. I was 18 years old, went to Australia. Then the next time I went to San Diego, not as big a deal, but still it was a fun day in San Diego. And it was it was a fun show to do. And I I worked a lot back in the 70s, you know, all those shows, the cop shows like Mannix and Adam 12 and and uh, what's the one with Robert Blake? Beretta did right. all those shows. And so I know St. Elsewhere was the game changer for you. Um, how did you get to tell us how you got that role? Well, that's an interesting thing that's really sums up my whole life. What I wanted was greatly inferior to what I actually got. Mm -hmm. I went in to read for the part of a regular character on the show called Dr. Peter White. And I read for it, read very well. And then I called up the agent or the agent called me. I learned I didn't get it. I said, who got it? You know, hoping that it, as sometimes was the case, my friend Barry Boswick would get it or Michael McKean or, you know, Jamie Cromwell would get it. All these wonderful people that I was often up against. And it was like family. It wasn't that at all. It was a guy named Terrence Knox. And I didn't really know him at the time. It turned out he was a wonderful actor and a different type entirely. So he was perfect for that part. But I didn't get the part of Dr. Peter White. I was crestfallen. So they threw me a bone and gave me a part that had one or two lines, Vicky very small part called Dr. Ehrlich. And so I went and did the one or two lines and something clicked with me and Bill Daniels, William Daniels, who's a good deal shorter than me. And I'm this tall, kind of lanky, goofy guy, want to be surgeon, want to be heart surgeon. He's a well-trained, brilliant, you know, charismatic heart surgeon himself. And he's my teacher as well as, you know, being a great doctor. And that dynamic of the two of us is what made the writers write another episode for the, those characters and another and another. I was one of the more popular characters on the show. Dr. Peter White, the part I didn't get, winds up getting shot and killed in episode in year three. And I was on all six years as Peter as Victor Ehrlich. So once again, I always got something better than what I wanted and hoped for. Mm. Wow. 
you you mentioned Bruno Kirby a, a minute ago. You had a beautiful relationship with. I was a huge Bruno Kirby fan. How did you and Bruno become friends? Same thing as it was with Jamie Cromwell and Barry Boswick and uh, Michael McKean and all of them. You know, I would be there in the room for an interview with him. You know, and we're very different types, Bruno Kirby and I, but to be seeing lots of different people for some parts or some, maybe for different parts. Even I think he was there often for another part different than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And finally, we started talking. I realized he was the son of an actor himself. Bruce Kirby, his dad, was a wonderful actor. And uh, so I got to be pals with him. And then we worked together on a movie called Super Dad, a Disney movie. And from that point on, we were like best friends and remained so till when he passed in 2006. What a loss. Everybody, Gary Shandling, me, all these people, Chris Guest, Jeff Goldblum, we were all great friends with Bruno. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy and a real role model for me. He, he was a very ethical, kind and giving gentleman. So I was lucky to know him. You talk in the book about how when you were... You were in a full body cast or some horrible? Thing. Yeah, I was in a spiker cast. I had one leg, the uninjured, unbroken femur on my right. That was free, could move around. But my left leg was plaster from my toes right up to my tits. And so, you know, your arms were free. You could go on crutches. But it was very hard with that to navigate a car or anything. You couldn't fit in a car. You had to be in, like, the back of a station wagon. So it was, and they learned, like, the next month to not do that anymore, to isolate your knee like that. That's you want to keep that knee moving so it doesn't, as mine did, lock up and no longer be a full knee. It can move like maybe 15, 20 degrees huh. of movement. You can't you can't immobilize the knee for six weeks in traction and eight weeks in a body cast. You can do that, but it's kind of medieval healing. They, they How stopped did that doing happen that. to you that you injured yourself so badly? I was at the ice house and I went between sets. I was going to go between sets to a party at, um, what was his name? A casting director, I'll think of his name in a while. But at any rate, I was gonna go, there's a big Hollywood party, there's gonna be lots of casting agents there, there's gonna be, you know, ladies Girls. there. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I left between sets from the Ice House in Pasadena, Marvin Page was his name, to Marvin Page's house. I didn't get on the Pasadena freeway. I finally looked at my watch and realized what time it was. I'm not gonna make it to Hollywood and back. And, be, you know, I'd be late for my entrance and uh, the second set. I had two sets to do at the ice house. So I drove back. But all that each turn, the mistake and moment that I took to look at the watch and do this or that put me right in the wrong place at the right time. Where this 67 olds came through a intersection. He had a red light. I had a green. But the law doesn't matter at that point. He fractured my femur and I was in a bad way for quite a while. And I was lamenting all this to Bruno. He said, OK, that's one way to look at it. If you'd gotten there five seconds earlier he would have missed you but if you'd gotten there just a quarter of a second later we'd be having a different conversation now you'd be in a wheelchair the rest of your life because it would have been your spine not your femur wow. that got broken and he was right of course so bruno always had a way of looking at it that was positive and, and very intelligent you had a lot you've had a lot of people in your life that uh were very positive and very intelligent. You mentioned Christopher Guest a little while ago. Now, I, I don't remember the circumstances, but I seem to recall that you were not hireable for film. Why weren't you hireable for films for a while? I was never blacklisted. I, my name was not in a drawer somewhere, you know, in a drawer <laughs> on a list or a piece of paper. But I just, I think I gave people the creeps, you know, because of all the environmental stuff. You shouldn't be in that SUV. <laughs> You came in a limo, you're a bad person. When I never have once done anything like that, I invite people, come ride the bus with me, take a bike ride with me. If you like it, bike to work. You know, I'm very, I try to be inclusive, but never scolding. But a lot of people don't know that. They're just afraid of some confrontation that they don't want to have. So with that, and let me not leave out the other obvious fact. There is a three strikes law in show business too. <laughs> okay. yeah. If you do three shows that are not only critically poorly regarded, but mm -hmm. also much more importantly, they do poorly at the box office. If you have a, a lead, your character number one, two, or three in the call sheet, you know, somebody's going to get the blame, and it was me. So I've been in three movies like that, and so I uh, I was in movie jail for a decade. So what what, what were the three movies, Ed, that, that put you in movie jail? It did jail? poorly uh, critically, uh, had no critical acclaim, and also did poorly at the box office. They were Transylvania 6, 5,000, mm -hmm. She-Devil, and Meet the Applegates. She Devil is a fine movie. So is Meet the Applegates. 
Transylvania 6 5000 is a fun movie for children, but uh, the other two are actually good movies in many ways. Not perfect movies, admittedly, but they're not horrible movies, but they did very poorly at the box office. And so because of that, you know, somebody's going to take a fall and it was probably going to be me. So how did how did your so how did Christopher Guest um, save you? <laughs> he saved me. Uh, well, first of all, he uh, he made a wonderful movie I was not in. So people knew he was going to make another great movie after that. The one I was not in, which I love more than all the movies, all the movies I was in or have seen of his. He made a movie called Waiting for Guffman. That was just this perfect, perfect movie. And so. He, I had heard he was going to make another one, and then I get this phone call. He wants to go to lunch with me, and I figured he wanted to talk about the latest electric car because he had the same interest in that sort of thing. He said, there's a character, the desk manager, you know, the assistant manager of the hotel, the uh, the guy there at, for Best in Show, and I would you consider being in it? I was like, be still my heart. I'll do craft service on your movie, Chris. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll, I'll cable. I'll try to get into local 728 and, you know, do grip work. <laughs> in local lady whatever you say and so he offered me the part in that film and i did the part and as part of this wonderful wonderful movie called best in show which parker posey is brilliant and chris is brilliant and fred eugene willard, levy and fred. fred willard catherine o'hara jim piddick mm. mike hitchcock i mean just what Amazing. a show mm -hmm. jennifer coolidge for god's sake Oh my gosh, that's right. I forgot about you. Jane, <laughs> Jane Lynch, come on. It just the list goes on. These wonderful, wonderful people. And so you you ended up being in every one of his films since that. I have time. been in every one since. So and, and also you started such out with a friend. Him in, in Spinal Tap, which was that's right. before all of that. I had met him in the 70s with Tony Hendra. He was playing guitar, doing some musical accompaniment accompaniment to something that the Lampoon was doing. So I went in there with the then editor of The Lampoon, uh, Tony Hendra. And there was this guy that I knew very well. I never met him, but I knew his sister and I knew his work. It was Christopher Guest. He had been on that Radio Dinner album, the National Lampoon's Radio Dinner, mm -hmm. all these radio comedy kind of skits and spoofs. It was just breathtakingly wonderful. And Chris was the best thing in it. So I got to know him then and work with him on uh, This Is Spinal Tap and then work with him again and all those wonderful improv movies. Amazing. Uh, and then you talk also about doing Saturday Night Live and how that's sort of like the ultimate. Um, and you did it. Uh, you did it when Lauren wasn't there, right? It was Dick Ebersol when you first hosted. Dick Ebersol was uh, the producer of the show at that time. But look at the cast. Jim Belushi, Billy Crystal, Christopher Guest, Martin Short, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, uh, writer Brad Hall, uh, uh, who else? Larry David was a writer on the show. He did a sketch with I was in, which was hysterically funny, as good as any Seinfeld episode. And uh, all that time, I don't think they knew that the diamond that they had there in their midst. He was just a brilliant writer back then. This is 1984 that I were, that was on Saturday Night Live. What a, a great time that was. I did a sketch with Billy Crystal. I think it was the year before when Martin Short was on, uh, when he first did Buddy Young Jr. But I think that was '83, actually. But anyway, yes, those. So, so Ed, you've done Gary all... Kroger. I left Gary Kroger. I'm and sorry. Gary I mean, Kroger, was... yes, that's and right. And Pamela Gary. Stevenson, Pamela Stevenson, married to Billy Connolly. So, what, so tell us about that experience. What is that like when you go in there and you have one week to to put on this? Like, what was your, what, doing the monologue, what was that experience like? It was a dream. Everything about it was a dream come true. You know, to was be on scary? Saturday Night Live. Yes, and I'll tell you why that's to its, to its advantage, to your advantage that it's scary. Because they tell you all week, they say, okay, you start, you're going to meet with the writers and you're going to get together and you're going to help us write the sketches that you're in. And any sketch, you know, you can be involved in any sketch, but we're going to write and oh by the way when we do the show there's a show before the show we do one at like 8 30 like a pre-show show we often we use pieces of that in case if something goes wrong at the later 11 30 show but it's going to be a mess that early show is kind of a mess so don't freak out next day how the sketch is working that you're writing tell me show me what you got let's get some of them on their feet wednesday more of that and oh by the way when we, we do two shows one's at 8 30 and that's going to be a nightmare but the 11 30 i said yeah you told me yesterday Thursday, 
And you know, there's an 8.30 show and it's going to be hard. Yeah, you said that before. <laughs> Finally, you go and you do the 8.30 show and it is a catastrophe beyond all words and description. It was back then, an unbelievable train wreck. Your adrenal glands are so squeezed with that 8.30 show. You are fearless by the 11.30. You can do anything. You can leap over buildings. You're just completely, you're no longer nervous. You're into the Zen experience of life. Okay, whatever. I'm a nightmare. I'm a train wreck. I shouldn't have ever been on this show. I'm way too untalented to be in this show. But I just blah, 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 blah. You do the opening monologue and it kills because you have no fear. It's been squeezed out of you. It's just a chemical process. It squeezed every bit of adrenaline your body can manufacture out of you at 830 so by 11.30, you have none left. It's genius. Lauren's a genius. I Even in his that. absence, it, it, it worked because of that. That's that's a great description of it. Um, you talk about a, a bunch of your work experiences, and one of them is working with Meryl Streep. What is it like when you're getting in the ring with Meryl Streep, like the greatest actress who's ever lived? What is that like? I, I literally thought I was being punk because I realized once I had <laughs> flown there, got put up in a hotel... I'm there in this room that's rented, you know, kind of room at the hotel where we're going to read a script and Roseanne Barr's there and all these people. I went, wait a second. What is today's day? This is April 1st. I'm being <laughs> punked again, like I was with Ed McMahon and them and, you know, Dick Clark. They punked me with this thing at my house in Ojai. They're doing it again. Like, I'm really going to be in a movie with Meryl Streep. Let's see the actress they got that looks like Meryl that's going to, wow. They really did good. That woman really looks like Meryl Streep. We start to read the script. And I realize, holy shit, it actually is Meryl Streep. I'm in a movie with Meryl Streep. Again, Chauncey Gardner, you know, wow. Zelig, whoever the hell I am. I'm, you know, Forrest Gump, and I'm somehow in this situation. I don't know how the hell I got there. I remember reading for it, and I remember I did one thing right, though, for the, for the interview process. I hired a guy. It was like $150, a lot of that. That was a lot of money back in 1989 for a guy that does cue cards. I had the, all the stuff. They were taping me in California to be sent, you know, by a FedEx to New York. Uh -huh. So it didn't matter what I did in the room. That was, there was no consequence of where they look. What are you doing? What do you have cue cards? Are you going to need cue cards on the set? What are you, an idiot? You can't <laughs> learn line. I learned the line so well. The guy had the cue cards. I never once looked at them, Vicky, but it was brilliant because I had a safety net there. If I go up, I went, oh, God, the line, the line, the line. I didn't do that at all. I did the scene, did it very well because I had the cue cards there one after another that I never looked at once. It was a very smart thing that I did. And I got the Okay, part. speaking of that, Ed, at this stage of life, I mean, I'm, I'm just a few years younger than you. That's terrifying to me. How do you learn lines at this? How do you even do this? Oh, honey, that was then. That was 1989. Yeah, I but how do you do it now? I did it fine through the 90s, but now... I tell you exactly how I do it. Yeah. I need to get the script two weeks in, in advance. They know that on Young Sheldon. They knew that on Better Call Saul. I think anybody my age who was on that show, they gave them to them because they're kind people. Bless this mess. <laughs> they gave it to me weeks in advance. Me, you know, me and Pam. Do you, have, do you have a process? Do you have a memorizing yes, process? Yes, it's just drudgery. The process is drudgery. You read them again and again and again and again and again. And I'll shut up at 400 more again. You just do them literally do you, 70 times a day for, the, do you for two record, weeks. Do you record it and then talk back? to? No, you don't do that. Eventually, just, when I'm ready to do it, I don't do that at all. I don't do it with anybody for a while. Maybe I do it just to hear the rhythm of it with my daughter. She would help me with lines. Hayden would help me. And mm -hmm. then when I'm ready to bring her back in, then I do it to see if I've got it in my pea brain. But I have to do it literally, no joking, probably 30 times a day for a full two weeks. And then it's not in my brain. I don't have to worry about my brain. It's in my muscle memory of my mouth. It's literally wow. something like that. I go, well, I don't know these lines. And here we are. I'm on Better Call Saul. And Bob Odenkirk is talking. I'm coming up next. I'm coming up next. Oh, God, here it comes. Ba -ba 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 Holy shit, that was a line. He says something again. I go, holy shit, I know that one, too. I didn't even know I knew it. Ba -ba 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 -ba. You know, just Does it ever fail stuff. you? Yes, it failed me with two good friends. One is a writer and director. One is a wonderful actress and writer and everything. I won't say who they are, but I showed up in a set. This is after I knew I had Parkinson's and I came there and I got the lines the morning that I shot. Now it's just a page and a half, but I got them the morning of. I went, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Those words are bad words. I couldn't do it. I thought I could do it and I kept trying to do it and I couldn't do it. 
they had like some cue card paper for me, but it was paper was making noise. I went, oh, take that away. I can do it. I can do it. I couldn't do it. They had to let me go. And I feel terrible that I did that to them, but I did. But they're still my friends and they still speak to me. So I love them beyond measure. I cost them like three hours out of a day. They had to go hire somebody else to do it. Michael McKean came and did it wonderfully. I couldn't learn them in you know the morning of. I just couldn't do it. I, so I don't play around anymore with that. I say, oh, my agent says it. I don't have to say it. Ed needs a script two weeks before. And the changes, if you have to make changes, we understand they have to be minor. So if you do major changes, they, you're going to need more time. And that's just well, the way good. it is. It's good. It's good. So, okay. So you brought that up. So let's talk about the Parkinson's. So you, you talk in the book about no, like noticing things in 2004 and you talk about a plane ride, which I don't really understand what happened to you. Can you explain that? Yeah. What happened was we took off in 2004. I like driving up to, to Vancouver, to Vancouver to work. I've even driven to Toronto to work. I don't like to fly. But right. on this particular morning, I had to fly because I had to do wardrobe fitting that day to work the next day. I had to get in the plane. So I got in the plane. We're about 2,000 feet off the runway, climbing. All of a sudden, Vicky, the plane plummets from the sky. It's no longer a plane. It's a feathered brick falling from the sky to the port side. And I understandably, I hope you understand why I did it. I went, oh, boy. <laughs> At which point, everybody in the cabin ahead of me turned around and looked at me. <laughs> Wondering, is there going to be a problem on this flight today? Because the plane was not pitching from the sky. I was not falling out of my seat. I was strapped into my seat, sitting as I'm sitting now, not going anywhere. And it was so violent, that kind of dizziness that came on me, came on to me like a a shot was uh, something with my inner ear, what have you. I managed to get through the rest of the plane ride, stumble off the plane. They didn't have to put me in a wheelchair. I was able to hang on the side of the jetway, get to a waiting car that took me to the hotel, called the production office right away, said, I need a doctor. I can't stand. I'm suddenly dizzy on the plane ride that's happened. I don't know what happened. They gave me some scopolamine or something like it, and it went away. And okay, that's great. But around that same time, all this other stuff happened. I lost half my sense of taste, half my sense of smell. Is, is that a common symptom? I, I'd never heard of that Very common before. with Parkinson's. Loss of taste and smell is very common. Another mm -hmm. virus, people get that from COVID. Right. It's kind of neurologic, mm -hmm. it's neurological damage, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the same with the inner ear, the little, you know, the little... Uh, the crystals. The, the, yeah, the crystals yeah. get moved around. That was, in my case, and the little hairs start to sag. For some reason, they get depleted by the Parkinson's or other neurological ailments. So I lost a lot of hearing and a um, sense of balance, what have you. Then the balance came back pretty good, but the sense of taste and smell didn't. They stayed about 50% loss. Then this other thing started to happen. I started to do what they call pilling. I'll manufacture it now. Like I'm trying to hold a pill right there. Uh -huh. uh, hold a pill between my thumb and index finger. That had been happening before all that, then after that. But it wasn't happening when that happened. My doctor would have right away went, oh, Christ, you've got Parkinson's. We didn't notice it because the trembling was not happening. So they thought I might have a brain lesion. That was a logical possibility they did a cat scan or an mri or something it determined i didn't have that and we just shrugged our shoulders something happened to me i got a virus or something who knows what then in 2016 i was starting to slur my words i was not speaking as clearly as i'm attempting to speak now and slur my words a bit more so than usual i have a lateral lisp as you know so it was more than that something else was going on and i had just one session with the speech therapist, Lisa Bolden. She called up my my doctor and said, I didn't see it on his chart. Why is it not, that doesn't, Ed's Parkinson's, is there a problem why it's not on his chart? Nobody knew was that I had Parkinson's. That's why it wasn't on the chart. I went and saw two top neurologists. They, of course, confirmed it. That, that was the case. My advantage was I rode my bike every day, having had it since 2004, clearly probably having it before that, eight grade, exercise vigorously in every way and just rode that bike thinking, man, I'm getting older quicker than I would think. You know, I just got harder and harder to ride the bike, but I rode up to Mulholland, down around Franklin, Franklin Canyon Lake and back home and always ate good and did upper body work and what have you. And that somehow, they say that's good for you and I believe it because it kept it at bay. Nobody knew I had it till 2016. I didn't even know I had it. Then it was slow, slow, slow. And now we've kind of stalled it with all the the stuff that Rochelle has found, some alternative medicine, and the AMA-sanctioned wonderful 
uh, you know, dopamine stuff that they give you is wonderful. Keeps the shaking. This is the way it is. I don't have to manufacture any pilling right now. Let me make sure you get both hands. Amazing. I can do a sobriety checkpoint, not have a problem. <laughs> and that's where Parkinson's can be in 2023. You know, you can do well by doing that stuff. Then for extra credit, if you got a wife like mm -hmm. mine, like Rochelle, she's like that Don Henley song, I will not go quietly. She was not ready to just take like the progression of it with the dopamine. Got me on glutathione, which helped me immeasurably. Something called NAD, stem cells, and hyperbaric chamber. Now, some people, this may not benefit. I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying go out there and do that stuff. But for me, it definitely worked. It all helped me. Some of it instantly, very quantifiable and instantly. The NAD and the glutathione, the hyperbaric chamber. I was a drummer, so I would do wipeout. Wait, what do you mean? I'm I would do this song called Wipeout. It's a drum no, solo. No, I know the song Wipeout. What do you mean you would do it? I would do it with my fingers on a desk before okay. I go in to get the NAD. Right. And I do it again after I had the NAD. It was always better after. Really? The reason I noticed that it, that it might be better on my upper body was because on my lower body, after the first session of Rochelle kicking and screaming, dragged me to go do this NAD bullshit. I thought it was nonsense. <laughs> I did it, but I went walking back to the car. I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm definitely walking straighter back to the car than going to the clinic. I was and walking you got, much And more you steady. had this instant, this was an instant thing. Instant. It happened, you know, within minutes of a two and a half hour treatment. NAD takes two and a half hours. Glutathione takes 15 minutes. But I had the same reaction with that. Walking back to the car, always walking better. So that's when I started to do the wipeout thing to see if it was just the lower extremities or if it was up in my arms and upper body too. And I would do it. It's always cleaner and better. Just being scientific as a drummer, which is a cleaner version of wipeout that I'm able to do, always better after the session, you know, getting that stuff done. And how but often I, do you do this stuff, Ed? I probably do. I do one of those at least once a week. I do multiple ones most weeks. I do like I'm going to do hyperbaric chamber and glutathione tomorrow no no maybe if you the next just step. do the hyperbaric chamber do you notice something different yes you get infused with oxygen it's just simple i'm a scuba diver and it can save your life if you get the bends because you get you get brought up to pressure you know you're down two atmospheres let's say like 60 feet or something you get bent you you go in the hyperbaric chamber and it you can stabilize with the pressure and also you, it's oxygen infused. It's rich in oxygen and it permeates all your cells with oxygen. It's just wow. very kind of mechanical and simple. It's not a, not rocket science. It just seems to work very well for most people. And I'm one of them. Well, I'm so thrilled that that's so I'm going to honor the time here to the temple of tranquility and step on it. Where can people come see you, Ed, um, to sign, get a signed book and to see you in person? I'm going to be at Chevalier Books. That's November 9th, a week from tomorrow, I think. Yes, I think it is. That's 133 North Larchmont in beautiful Los Angeles. That's the Hancock Park area, right near where I live. My first house was right one block away from Larchmont. I love that neighborhood. So I'm going back to Larchmont, to Chevalier Books on Larchmont, 133 North. It's a beautiful, beautiful bookstore. And come, but it'll be up on my website. And thank you. Um. I, I love you so much. I'm I'm so thrilled to see you doing so well. And and okay, so the strike is going on, but you have stuff. Department of One maybe with Amy Madigan maybe gonna drop. Happen. I don't know if they have a, if they have a waiver. I don't know about that. I haven't heard anything about that. So we'll see. I think they're gonna come to a conclusion soon. I think they're. I think we're gonna have a deal soon. But again. It's up to the negotiators, my friend David Jolliffe and Jolie Fisher and Fran Drescher, all these wonderful people doing the work that needs to be done. And I'm very confident that it'll, they'll get a good deal. Well, thank you so much for all that you do. We didn't even get into your environmental stuff this time, but I'm so grateful for you, Ed, and all that you do for for our planet, for for our city, for our, our sober community and for um, our friendship. And um, I treasure you. And thank you so much for doing this. I adore you. Right back at you, Vicki. It's always good to see you.
Passa a bola. I look forward to seeing